I can clip this, you know, as much as I want, and I'll, I'll post it if it's if it's good. If it's if it's a good conversation, which I think it might be. well so Paul Sheehan why don't you tell everybody who might be watching this video eventually who you are and what you do okay well right now I don't do a whole lot of anything except work insane amount of hours but I used to host uh, a program called Road to Reason Skeptics Guide to the 21st Century in Virginia and uh, was pretty much a key member of the atheist community in Northern Virginia DC Maryland uh, I know a lot of the people that uh, have taken up positions in American atheist, Beltway atheist, things of that nature, and did it a lot that I could to try to promote atheism, um, secularism, humanism. But uh, it, it, it was a challenge because even then, before everything hit the fan with you, um, there were a lot of people out there pushing agendas that had nothing to do with the atheist concept by itself and it was a it was a minefield always trying to navigate that and so i'm glad to have this conversation with you today as somebody who's experienced the fallout from some of that i'm not glad that you went through it but um i think that um there's a lot of toes that you know people are worried about having to step on and sometimes just stepping on them is the best way to get through it and wow. get past it, so Especially when when I've been stepped on, <laughs> when those yeah. toes, when those toes have stepped on me and those heels have stomped on me, um, it's uh, it's 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 been a, a, an interesting and horrific experience. Uh, why is this your particular interest? Well, I okay. So first of all, um, I wanted to have a discussion with you a couple of years ago about you know some of the things that I saw that you were kind of picking up and championing on that kind of concerned me. Um, and you and I had an exchange and, you know, the way I remember it was you basically said something to the effect that if you have these opinions, we can't be friends. And um, oh. I mean, I might be wrong on that, but that's the way I remember it. And what I did was, is I took a number of the people that were local and I said, listen, I want to make sure I don't upset Dave. You know, I, I got a lot of respect for him. And they were kind of like, yeah, you probably should back off. You know, it sounds like he doesn't want to have this discussion. Um, what were the points? Well, the point was, you know, I, 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 a lot of it had to do with the feminism stuff. And there was just this kind of like, you know, really pushing so hard with it and, there were some discussions that you had, I think, in public forums that were kind of like, and again, this is a summation of, of the way I recall it, which is if you, if you don't call yourself a feminist, you're not, not a friend of mine, or if you don't take these certain positions, you're not, you know, you're not really somebody I want to deal with. It was something along those lines. And um, where I, having the experience that I had with the show, um, I was always really concerned about shutting people out of the community um, after you know it was funny because when I saw your interview with Sargon of Akkad his his political kind of stances on things are not where I come from I actually come from you know what I would call a hardcore leftist position which wouldn't look anything the way he would describe a hardcore leftist position I've been I've been to Cuba I met Fidel Castro in the 90s I've you know, I've, I've been, you know, I've been involved, you know, on the other hand, I'm very rapid, very pro Second Amendment, but from a worker's perspective, like working class people's perspective kind of thing. So I didn't, I didn't want him necessarily to kind of capture the, uh, you know, kind of like capture and hold on to that he holds this perspective and kind of identify people who are left this as being all like radical SJWs, because I have a I have a real problem with a lot of the SJW attitudes, not necessarily with some of the positions, but but how they go about um, pushing their agendas. Where I come from, um, say like someone is really right wing, but for whatever reason, let's just say that they support women's right to choose on an abortion issue. Mm -hmm. There's some people in the SJW. W community will say that person's alt right. You can't have anything to do with them. We need to like out them and burn them, you know. 
where I'm yeah. thinking the only, person, the only person who's hurt by that in that case is the woman if the legislation doesn't get passed protecting her rights to choose. So, so if you, if you, so the, the problem that I've seen is that the, the, the woke left, this is what I call them, the woke left. I'm, I, I, I treat wokeism as a religion, even though it's not technically a religion, but it, it certainly does look like one, but they'll call anyone. They call me all right. Now sure. Sure. they call me all right. I, I'm, I, I haven't changed. <laughs> well, I've changed a little bit. I, I've I, I've gone away from that toxic place where I was with you, where if you don't agree with me, we can't be friends. But I'm still pro-choice. I'm still separation of church and state. I'm pro, pro still pro LGBT. I'm I'm still left. Yeah. Um. Uh, but I'm considered alt right by the woke left because I'm not in their specific in group anymore. And that's the in group that I was in with you. Go ahead. That's right. It's just it's it's important to remember that throughout history, um, the right, the left, liberals, conservatives have all wound up taking at various times these very toxic positions. Um, and maybe there's a discussion to be had what really drives it. Is it insecurity of their political positions? Is it a sense of power tripping? I don't know. But it's not indicative of any one group to behave like this. If you look throughout history, it, it, it's it's not. Um, it's not something that I think that people can just pin on leftists. Um, and that tends to be something that a lot of the right or conservatives are doing right now. I sure do not share the values of the people who went after you the way they went after you. Now, to be fair, and I'm just saying this just to be fair, I don't know exactly what transpired in your situation. I know what you have to say. I know what other people have had to say. I'm not here to have that discussion. What I'm here to have is a discussion with you as to how you were treated. Um, and, you know, and I have to say that, okay, so I reflect back on my own behavior at that time too. So here's what kind of happened. And, I, and I'll say that I apologize to you uh, for the way I reacted. And, and this is maybe something people can just look at and say they don't even have to have an intention OK, I get a phone call and it's like, did you just hear what happened with Dave Silverman? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, what happened with Dave Silverman? He raped somebody. So guess what I did? What? I picked up the phone. and I said, did you just hear what happened? Dave Silverman raped somebody. Yeah. I didn't follow my own rules about skepticism, about about slowing the process down, evaluating. So. You know, somebody called me out on it very early on, and I'm very grateful to that person. And I, when I started immediately, I, I, you know, and that's part of this problem, I guess, we have with the social media now, which is everything, you know, you have to be first to get it out there. Or otherwise, you, you're not in. You're not. Right. You know, right. right. You, get, you get creds for, for being first to trash. Yeah. And that's not fair to the person that it's being done to. So. In all in all fairness to you, I apologize for that, and I did cor I called people back, and I and I did say, you know, I wanted to stand corrected. I I you know I kind of ran my mouth without really looking, and that is the first thing that I think people have to do in these types of situations is to stop when they hear something like that. Just because they're hearing it doesn't even remotely mean that it's true. But the next question is like, okay, well, I I don't say that you I know you really well. Like we're not, we haven't like gone out and had dinner, but I, I'd like to think I know you well enough, at least cursory, to think that that doesn't sound like Dave Silverman. I, I know the guy's a champion of women's rights. I know that he's, you know, that that respecting women is important to him. He certainly espouses that publicly. I've seen him espouse it privately. So, you know, who benefits from this? That's the you know, the people who are trashing me get their 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 echo tunnel their echo channels to to say yay you yeah and uh, and it's it's ridiculous the way they're behaving and you know it, it's it's really saddens me to think of how often and how much i did that too i mean the, the fact that i told you that I, we couldn't be friends because you didn't hold into a certain position um that has never been me and uh, it was only me for a period of time. Um, and, it, it, you know, I'm, I'm embarrassed and ashamed that I was there. I'm so glad 
I mean, you were saying before that you're not glad that this happened to me, but I am glad to be out of it. I'm glad to, I mean, if there is a, a tiny silver lining to the horrible thing that happened to me, it is that I'm not there anymore. I'm not in among those people anymore. I'm not, I'm not that asshole, that short-sighted uh, friend pushing away guy. I've always been about unity. I've always been about, um, you know, working with people with who we do disagree. Um, that's my, my, sorry, Dave, go ahead. That's okay. It, it's, um, it's disconcerting to hear that I even, that I did that. I'm, I mean, I, I remember it vaguely. Yes. Uh, and, um, I, I'm sorry for doing that, Paul. I, I, that was wrong of me. Oh, was wrong of me. I appreciate it. And it's not, it's not, Sadly, it is not something that I think you can blame an individual for because it's part of groupthink. Yeah. And it's, um, and it's very hard to break through and address people. And I guess the one big piece of advice I would have for anybody out there is to remember there's a big difference between treating an allegation serious and just outright believing the allegation. So it's okay if someone says something happened to me for you to say, all right, I I hear what you're saying. I think what you need to do is follow the protocols that we as a society have established to ask that that be investigated or looked into. doesn't mean that I should just like automatically shun the person that they're making the allegation against. Also, there's a really good discussion as to ha have whether we should be shunning people at all. If somebody does something that is inappropriate and it's established, one thing I know from criminologists and, and from you know, psychiatrist is that while you try to hold somebody accountable, um, how that person reintegrates into society, how, you know, is very important too. Yeah. And the way that these SJW movements are, which are really just out to destroy the person. And it's, there, there's no real structure to like, okay, holding the person accountable, rehabilitating the person. These aren't even part of the equation. It's about crushing the person. Yeah, there's no transformative justice here at all. Uh, and there's no redemption. I mean, can you think of a single person anywhere? I'm mean, just, just take a moment here. Can you think of a single person who has received redemption from the woke left? I, I've seen, I've seen, um, a few people that have started down this road where like people are starting to point fingers at them. And I, and I hate to use these terminologies, but they're kind of accurate, which is almost spectral evidence where if you think somebody's about to call you a witch, the best thing for you to do is start screaming that somebody else is a witch. Yeah. You know? And, and I've seen that I've seen like, not, not to, not to the level where you were, where they the, were coming after you, but I've seen like where, did you hear about so-and-so or did you, you know, the rumors are starting to, to move in that direction. And that person comes out and they just start destroying other people. And it's like the crowd is what they need is a sacrifice at that point. You know, so I've seen people get out from underneath it right before it's about to happen to them. And. Okay. Uh, but have you seen anybody get redeemed? No. Have you seen anybody? Have you seen anybody get accepted back? P. Z. Myers wrote a really awful piece. Uh, I, I can't believe the quality of his writing now. He used to be. Well, maybe I was in it, but maybe I was. Uh, Brother, I I stopped following P. Z. Myers like five years ago because he was doing that crap. But go I on. Mean, it, but I mean, let's let's. But he wrote an article about a month ago saying Dave Silverman has not been redeemed. And I read that article and laughed a little bit because there is nobody that has been redeemed. There has been nobody that has been redeemed. Um, Al Franken never hurt a person. He's not redeemed. He lost his job in the Senate because he went like this in a picture. Right. He is not redeemed. He, and, and when I went down, I went, I mean, I actually have hard evidence that both the accusers lied, okay? I actually, it's not that they didn't, it's not only that they didn't file a police report, it's not only that it's innocent and proven guilty. I actually have hard photographic and recorded evidence that my accusers lied. That is not enough. 
<laughs> that is, and, and, and then on top of that, I lost everything I loved. I lost the life I built for the past 30 years. I lost everything. And then the entire movement pointed at me and laughed and said, we hate you now. That is not enough. Now that I've been hired by AAI, the people who are still hateful of me, despite the fact that I have evidence to prove my innocence, despite the fact that I paid a huge penalty anyways, they are trying to, they're still hating me. And they always will. Me. They always will. The yeah. fact, who is PZ Myers to redeem you? Who is, oh. right, who, what mechanisms did he put in place by which you can be redeemed? I mean, this is the this is the problem with the woke, what you call the woke left, or I call the SGWs, which is it is really about power tripping. It is it's about control. I can't tell you how many times I see white liberals do this stuff where they talk about the evils of white people, and it's kind of, and, and it's kind of like it, it's all about power jumping the ladder. Like for instance, I I, I work part time for a company that does higher educational videos, and we were talking today about. Uh, Facebook and just how some of the awful stuff Facebook does to monitor people and they were talking about um, the fact that Facebook wrote an algorithm that uses the scratches and dust in your lens when you take a picture um, to if, you, if I take a picture of you and then I take a picture of somebody say generic person Sarah okay it picks up on that dust and scratches, and it now knows those pictures came from the same camera, and so those two people likely know each other, right? So the comment that was made was, but well, that's what happens when you get a bunch of bored white rich guys that are nerds in a room together. It turns out the guy who wrote this algorithm's name is Ben Chen. He's Asian, right? But this is the woke mentality. It's the same mentality which says – that if you look at a girl the wrong way, you're eye raping her. Eye raping, yeah. You know, it's like it's kind of like it's kind of like, and in those people's minds, being a man, it, it makes you scum. Being white makes you scum. But, you know, it's like where's the where is the uh, process of being skeptical about who wrote the program? Like, first thing I would do is research who wrote this program. I want to know more about the mind that came up with this, not about the skin color. And, and, and well, what does it matter? I mean, it, yeah. it, does it matter if it's a white guy that came up with that or, or a black woman? Does it, does it, does, is it relevant? It's only relevant because people are looking for reasons to hate. It's only yeah. relevant because people are looking for reasons to have outrage when there is none. The, the problem is that feminism won, okay? And there is no more need for a feminist movement in America. And, and well, except for the fact that we need to be an example to, to non-America. And we need to protect feminism, but we win. We did win, and so the the feminists now are just trying to find reasons to be outraged because they want to be activists. They want to do good. They're trying to do good, but there's nothing to do good about because the second wave feminists won. There is no more glass ceiling. There's a yeah. bunch of different women who could win the presidency, and it's not going to be a big deal when it is. Nobody is breaking any glass ceilings anymore. So when we when when we're looking at the feminists, they're just crazy trying to find reasons to be mad. When I got this, when I got AAI, uh, Sakibu Hutchinson wrote an article about me getting the job because I'm an old white guy. I, I mean, it doesn't matter that I may be the most qualified person in the world for this job. It's I'm an old white guy, therefore. They created the position for me because I have a penis and light skin. Right. It, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, I created the reason rally. I, I, I mean, I wrote a book about how I changed the country with my brain, but that's okay. They hired me because I have a penis and white skin. This is um, an outrage machine that, that lives to support itself. To the to, to the death of anyone they determine to be bad, and yeah, white guys are pretty bad guys, and yeah. we're not redeemable ever. Ever, yeah. yeah. It's it, it's interesting, David, because I've watched um, what I would call a purge of intellectuals from the atheist community in favor of SJWs. Yeah, I, I've looked at people like Richard 
Dawkins, who, you, you know, if you, 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 you know, you were around, you would go out and give these great speeches in the 90s and debate people and you know, people like Hitchens, you know, Hitchens, you know, died, but even some of this was going on right before he died. And these people stopped getting divided, stopped getting invited to debates. But more importantly, is they, they stopped started being afraid to even like stick their necks out publicly because they knew that if they said the wrong thing, they could be destroyed and attacked by people who don't even have college educations in the fields, which they claim they're championing. And, and it's like Dawkins tweeted something. I I think it was, it was a cartoon or something. He retweeted it. And there were all these calls for him to, you know, resign from the Dawkins Foundation and that he was a bigot and a misogynist. And it was a Michael deGrasse Dyson recently wrote something online about the gun issue. Um, and, you know, he was saying, do you know that cigarettes kill more people and cars kill more people? He wasn't saying that he, one way or the other what his position was on guns. He was kind of saying, hey, you know, there are these other things out there that people maybe should also be worked up about or possibly even be more worked up about. And I actually saw people that were leftists calling him the N-word and a sellout. So it's like it's yeah. kind of like it's kind of like if you are not in the camp screaming witch with everyone else, you'll be denounced as a witch and you will be burned at the stake. And it's it's extremely dangerous to watch what's going on because they are going after the intellectual base of our community and have been doing so for a very long time. So this is a really important point. And one of the things that I'd like to expand on that is the intellectual laziness that I have seen. Um, and, and, and yeah, you know, this matches up. They are drumming out everybody who is intellectual. And it's not just the white men because they're drowning out, you know, Ayan Hirsi Ali as well, because she's, not black enough or not woman enough or whatever, but she speaks against Islam and Islam is protect is protected. So uh, the ex Muslims are are out. Um, so you know, like Sarah Hader is not a, a good person either uh, in their book. But I mean, this is one thing that I've noticed is that these people don't read. They don't read. They don't yeah. debate. They don't have a knowledge base. They hate ignorantly. They don't. They, in, in fact, they, they, they seem to eschew knowledge. They seem to look down on information. Of course, the wokest culture, the, the, the um, critical theory, is that there is no objective information, right? One plus one only equals two to the white man. And right. it's, uh, it's, um, it allows them, I believe, to just say, well, one plus one equals three to me as a black person. That's my perspective. That's my learned experience. Uh, I don't have to actually learn about math in order to say that. I can just say that and be protected uh, and, and have that opinion protected. And so now we've got a situation where people are just making shit up yeah. and using their intersectionality as a defense against criticism. Instead of what I used to do, what Dawkins used to do on stage, which is defend ourselves with knowledge, with facts, with books, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and they don't, they don't seem to read, they don't seem to know anything, uh, and they seem to be very proud of that, because knowledge itself, in many, in, in many cases, is uh, an acquiescence to white privilege. Well, and they're very apt at getting people to go at each other. Say, for instance, like, okay, I know people who are transgender, and I mean really transgender. They literally have dysphoria. They've had operations. And they're looking at some of this stuff, and they're going, what the F are these people talking about that that I'm a pansexual, transsexual? Like, it's just gotten so removed from human experience, and it really is, well, I need to carve myself a space within this power structure. So what I will do is I will say I'm a victim, and if you don't let me in, and you don't let me have some control, I'll denounce you, and I'll get everybody to tear you down. You're my oppressor. You're my oppressor. I'm the victim. You're my oppressor. And um, if you even question that, you're oppressing me. Right. So it's not as if I have to actually oppress you in order to oppress you. I just have to say, you're a victim in order to oppress you. 
Mm -hmm. I just have to call you out on your victimhood. I just have to say uh, the glass ceiling is not there anymore in order to be a male chauvinist, a misogynist. I, I only have to say, you know what, um, you know, the, the statistics show X, Y, and Z in order to be a bigot or racist or homophobe. All I'm doing is quoting statistics. And it's, um, it's because the, the facts don't matter anymore. The knowledge is a negative. It's better to just make your shit up. It's, it's fuck a lot easier, right? It's way <laughs> easier to make your shit up and then just stand behind your intersectionality as a buffer. You can't say uh, one plus one is not four. I'm black. Right. Not, I'm a woman, so well, one plus one equals 38. And you don't know my lived experience, so you can't debate me. You're just... You're kind of half joking about that that numerical thing, but there actually is a video of a female professor who is African American, or I think she's African in descent, and she's talking about how math is the tool of white imperialism. Yeah, I'm not making it up. Yeah, and and somebody stood up and said something like, "Hey, you know, they were using math in Egypt where people were black two thousand years ago," and he was kicked out for disrespecting her and it's like um that's just you're like wiping two thousand plus three thousand years of history off the map because some professor who's an sjw is offended by your racist imperialist position and so and and offended because she couldn't back that up right she couldn't combat that she couldn't say well you're right maybe i'm wrong on this she has to say Fuck you, get out of my class. I'm not going to debate you. This is the thing. They eschew knowledge. They eschew skepticism. They eschew rationalism. What they say is, is done. And whether you like it or not, and if you're a fucking white guy and you want to debate that, you're a symptom of the patriarchy. You're a symptom of the oppression. Because how dare you say that this cell phone is based on physics that will work with everybody whether or not you're black or white. This is white man physics. Uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's really deeply ridiculous that and it's the scientific method is being, is being politicized, uh, that, that knowledge itself is being politicized. And that now we, if, you, if you use common sense, global reasoning, Black people use the scientific method. White people use the scientific method. Brown people, red people, yellow people use the scientific method. And it all works, but it's patriarchy-based. Yes, patriarchy, imperialist. Um, and, and this is not to say that there aren't people who have patri patriarchal attitudes or imperialist attitudes or positions. This stuff actually, to the detriment of attacking those real issues, uh, undermines people who have legitimate beefs because it's the spectrum becomes so absurd that you can't distinguish between a real grievance and one of these fabricated ones. Uh, and it's starting, it's starting to permeate into our, you know, we talked about how the intellectual base is being purged, but it's also with what's left of it, it's permeating into it and it's infecting it. And an example of this is again, this, this thing I was doing today, they were talking about, um, AI with facial recognition and what they said is that white people it's much more effective with white people and there's a lot more errors with people say that are that are black and and this can lead to mistaken identity you know if the police are looking for someone and they show up they get the wrong person so these are people that have college educations that I'm talking to they're in their 30s to 40s and somebody blurts out well, that's because the people that are writing the software um, write their bias into the software. And now, here's the thing. I know from having been to film school, to having uh, under studied um, uh, television and how uh, you light human beings for camera, that black people, for instance, uh, their face absorbs more light. Shadows don't show up as well under their nose and in certain parts of their face just because of the way the pigmentation uh, reflects light or doesn't reflect light. Mm -hmm. Therefore, AI technology will by definition not be as effective on someone who does not have those extra key points 
that are reliable as someone whose face is of a lighter complexion that can contrast shadows better and in, in, in things like eye sockets going in. But everyone else in the room is like, she said it, so we have to agree with it. Yeah. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling kind of mindset. Yeah. It's like, after a while, it becomes the educational basis. It, it, it's this, what they call conventional wisdom is now replacing real educational understanding. And I'm watching people who have educations and watching people who are intelligent now starting to mimic these languages. It is no longer just a fringe group of woke SJWs. It is starting to seep into the rest of our society. Yeah, and, it's, 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 go ahead. And the consequence for you is that, um, and again, I, 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 I don't have any reason to suspect these things were true. I don't know if they were true, but the the consequence for you is from the sex perspective you know you're you're a casualty of it yeah. see i also have no reason to believe these things are not not true because you've never been given your day of you know to stand up and defend yourself yeah. you were just thrown under the bus and you were thrown under the bus and, and i'm not shitting you dave it took all about an hour literally from the moment this was announced you're reputation in the community. I watched it just explode over the internet. It took literally about 60 minutes for your entire lifetime that you've given this community. I watched within 60 minutes of everything that you put into this go right down the crapper. And it was based off of an allegation. Yeah. It took nothing else. Nothing. The most painful part of my life. The most painful experience of my life to watch that strip for me. It felt literally horribly painful. And yeah, there was, and, and and it's all because I mean they 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 say that white men have power, but these two women just raked the hell out of me. They they raked me right over the coals and they shut me down. Who has the power? Yeah. Who has the power? Did I have the power over Rose St. Clair, having you know told her in advance I wasn't going to hire her? Uh, didn't you know I wasn't in charge of her in any way? Uh, or, or did she have power over me because she snapped her fingers and destroyed my life and everything I built for by lying? Think about that. I mean, think about the, the and so you were talking before about the, the perceived victimhood. They claim victimhood even though they're in power. They claim victimhood when they're not the victims. I mean, I'm the victim here. I'm not claiming to be the victim, but I am the victim here. I'm the victim of two people in power who lied and used that power to destroy me for what was apparently shits and giggles. Well, or in this case, in this case, and you know, and again, like I say, I'm not, you know, I, I my intent is to kind of believe you, but that's, you know, I, I guess people would say, well, how could you believe him and not them? But the thing is, I, I look at the evidence, or in this case, the lack of evidence. Where are the police reports? Where are the, you know, and, and this is something we have to be very careful, Dave, about is like policing our own community, too, because I watched what happened with Lawrence Krauss, and that was a sham, okay? And I got into it, and I, I don't know if I'm going to name names, but it was somebody who was with the American Atheist, who was part of their, you know, one of their lawyers. We got into a debate online over Lawrence Krauss, and they were like, well, you know, the college found that, that, that he, he did do this. I'm like, no, first of all, the college found they didn't want to continue their contract with him after their investigation, but, they, but they're not a court. They have a vested financial interest at stake here. It is, it is worth it to them to wash their hands of them if they think it affects their bottom line or their reputation. They're not a truly independent legal body that doesn't have anything at stake. Correct. And so, and so, th so this lawyer is like, well, you know, you know, going on and on about well, this legal definite. Look, he's not in a fucking court. He he's in. He, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, excuse my language. He's not in a court. <laughs> uh, but I mean, this is this is how they stand by themselves. They they. I mean, when American atheists uh, threw me out, they had a, a written policy which I wrote by the way, uh, which guaranteed, which mandated due process with me being present. Right. And when they 
shit me out. I mean, they basically did the same thing that the university did to Lawrence Krauss, only without the due process. They just said, okay, Dave's out. And then they said, we don't, we're not legally bound to give you due process. That was their line. It's, and, and like, I mean, I was watching um, uh, my former friend Ed Buckner online just, uh, just a few days ago. And he was saying, oh, well, the, the, we don't, you know, due process is a legal term and we don't have to do it. But they don't even, the, what they're doing, due process is the embodiment of skepticism and rationalism. Due process is like the legal version of the scientific method. It's how you do skepticism. And you do skepticism for one reason, to find the truth, not because it's legally required of you. You do skepticism to find the truth. And when they, they, they say, well, we're not legally, uh, uh, legally mandated to do this, they're saying, they're exactly saying, we're not legally mandated to find the truth, to try to find the answers. We are legally allowed to jump to conclusions and act on it, which they are. But that's not the point. A skeptical organization should want to find the fucking truth. A skeptical organization should want to know what both sides are, especially if they have a written policy that says we've thought about this before and we have decided that we want this. That's actually one of my notes. It says the Society of Skeptics should avoid at all costs generalizations about groups or people or even individuals as all and always demand evidence and facts to the highest degree possible. I don't have anyone say that I'm a skeptic. Yet I can wash my hands of Dave Silverman um, without without the concept to due process. I, I was raised with this idea of treating people with some level of virtue and and you know giving the benefit of the doubt and treating people as human beings. Now this is where I find people who call themselves humanists that did this. You um, know, it's uh, like, <laughs> humanism humanism is 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 dead. Well, at least it's dying for. Uh, at the hands of the woke movement. I wrote a, a new version of humanism while I was in the hole. And, um, you know, I don't know what I'll do with it, but um, it, 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 is a, it is a version of humanism that I think uh, is, is lost in, in today's society, a version of humanism that actually, um, you know, talks about what is good, what is bad. Let's make good happen. Let's make bad not happen. And by the way, if you can make good happen, you should make good happen. You have a responsibility to make good happen. And none of this stuff, I mean, the uh, American Humanist Association disaffiliated with AAI completely uh, because they hired me. Okay, so, 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 I have all my evidence. You, you mentioned evidence. Well, I have evidence and I put it up on my website. They don't care. They don't care. It's not about being good. It's not about making good. And it certainly isn't about standing up for truth. It's about the politics. Yeah. It's about what does this look like to the people who are going to hate us if we don't do what they say. It's yielding to terrorism. It's yielding to terrorism, folks. Well, it, it, it is. And that but also it's it's perpetuating it because it legitimizes it and you know and when you call something humanism and that version of humanism is destroying someone based solely off of allegations people tend tend to think well i want to be humanist i want to care about people i mean there is something to be said about a name and the value of what you call something yeah and and they have perverted the terminology um you know, it's interesting too, and again, I don't really know the, the back details of what happened with Beth Presswood. What I do know is what happened publicly, and I know that she's no longer married to who she was married to. Yeah. And I and I have a hard time believing that that person and and I can, I would and I don't profess to speak for him because I've not discussed this with him. Um, but there's an indication that I get from what I've seen as little as I have publicly is that if he really believed her, he would have stood by her. And I think that that something happened between those two as a result of this, that they're no longer together, which is an indicator to me that she wasn't straight with that person. So well, I, you know. I I don't know about, I don't know where Matt's head is, okay? He is a, a protesting too much kind of person. Sure. Um, and he is going to everybody that he knows saying, Dave is a horrible, terrible, disgusting, evil person. And if you're his friend, you're not my friend. And I've had friends call me 
and say, Matt called me and said and made this ultimatum, and they're choosing me just because they don't want to be put in that situation. But my point is that, you know, this thing with me and Beth happened in 2015. Matt knew about it in 2015. In 2017, he didn't tell the board that they were, I mean, he was on the board when I was reelected to the presidency. In 2017, he said that on recording that there were some people that he won't get on stage with, but I'm not one of them. He won't get on stage with Dan Arell because Dan Arell uses bad words, but me, apparently he thought I was a rapist. I'm okay. But so that's a 2017 and then 2018, he's all mad about me again. So I don't believe him. Right. I believe that Matt Dillahunty knows Beth Presswood is lying. Well, and this is what my point is, is that he's no longer married to her. And I think that, that, that there is some, you know, I think, and again, I don't know all the personal fallout they have had between each other, but if things were peachy and rosy keen, if, if, if someone you loved, okay, that you, that you had a good relationship with came to you and told you they had been raped or sexually assaulted or something like that, like that nature, would you then have the type of, of, like fallout he's had with her and like yeah i mean there's something what i'm suggesting is is that and and it's a suggestion i don't claim to know is that that i believe what happened between you and breath press would probably played a part of why they're no longer together i, I don't want to think so frankly i want right. to think that i, I want to think it and i'm ashamed to say that i want to think it um i know that um I have heard that she left him, and I have heard that he called her a manipulative fucking liar when she did. Um, but he doesn't seem to understand that she was also a manipulative fucking liar when she manipulated him by lying to him about me. And I believe that maybe, well, I suspect that maybe he is, um, well, I, I don't know. I believe he's complicit. The the evidence suggests to me, I mean, listen, Paul, if I sexually assaulted your wife and you were on my board and I was <laughs> up to become president again, would you not raise the issue? Would you not would you if I thought if I molested, if I attacked your wife and I got you in a room two years later and I said, Hey Paul, man to man, how are you and me? Would you say we were okay? Would you say it was water under the bridge? Would you say that there are small things that you're not going to worry about, but there are other people that talk to you with bad words that you don't like, and they're much worse than me? I don't think you would. I think if I molested your wife, I don't even know if you're married, but I think if I attacked your wife, and then I went to the board and I was pre and you were president of, or you were on the board that I was getting reelected on, you'd wave your hands. You wouldn't say, okay. I'm going to keep quiet and allow this rapist, this horrible, evil rapist, to, con to continue being president and represent our organization and to go around on book tour and, and look at all the women I was exposed to. I could have been raping here and there and everywhere, and it would have been Matt's fault. And by the way, why haven't there been any police charges? Right. Not well, even a report. You asked me this question, if you raped somebody I knew or loved, wife, Otherwise, the worst words that would have been out of my mouth is I've already filed my complaint with the police. I've already, I've already gone in and given a statement. You know, that's the first thing you're going to hear out of my mouth. And the next thing you hear out of my mouth is I'm giving the police everybody's phone number of yours that, I, that you and I know so they can talk to them too. Uh -huh. that, that would be the conversation I would be having. If I really believe for a moment that you committed a sexual assault, I don't need to hate you, but I want you held accountable. And I want you stopped. Right. I, mean, I would hate you. I don't know. I mean, you know. They, you have every right to hate me. Right. The point is, the point is. You wouldn't do nothing. I would be actively pursuing that matter. And there would be a paper trail. And you would know it's coming. Yeah. So. So I don't believe it. Yeah. I have a recording here. I have. Uh, look at the evidence here. Uh, this is pretty solid evidence that either Matt Dillahunty didn't believe Beth. Or he didn't care. Right. And now he does. Maybe he didn't care. Maybe he's like, all right, well, I, you can go rape all the people you want. I don't give a fuck as long as I don't have to cause any waves. But that's not what Matt Dillahunty is all about. 
He's a fighter. He's intelligent. He's a powerful person. And he was my boss. And he did nothing. Well, one of my favorite Matt Dillon honey uh, quotes of all time, and I, I use it all the time, is come at me with your best argument first. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like, what's his best argument in this? I mean, what's his, I'm what? Poopy. Huh? I'm poopy. I'm very, very poopy. I'm You're a bad, disgusting, and you can hear him talking, I'm a bad, disgusting, evil, idiot, fucking, fucking, idiot, fucking, it, it, it sorry, I put, you protest too much. But it, I'm saying he is an intelligent guy, and he is somebody who definitely can route out you know, the root of a logical question and find an answer. And that's the best that he's dropped on this. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, I don't know. And, you know, kind of switch gears slightly, if you don't mind. Yeah. I've noticed this, we keep seeing this happening to guys in the movement. And, and I'm not, I'm not picking on you um, because I've seen it happen to other people where they kind of take a position of playing into the hands of the, I don't know what you want to call them, third wave, new wave feminism or whatever it is, yeah. and they get bitten by it. What have you, Dave Silverman, learned from this experience? How would, If you were to talk to the old Dave Silverman before this happened, what would be the single piece of advice you would give? Oh, there's more than one single piece of advice, Paul. Um, the first thing is that I actually didn't have nearly the friends that I thought I had. Um, and that there's a quality that the quality of your friends matters. Um, the people who um, were who I considered my friends back then had only been with me through good times. Um, we had only shared good things together, and as soon as the bad thing happened, they bailed. And when that bad thing happened, um, they bailed, and they just—I mean, my best friends in the movement, my best friends on the board never said dave did you do it never said dave you know what about this dave tell me they never said anything um and that's a shitty shitty friend um even though i thought they were my best friends they were shitty shitty friends um and i hope those people learn how to be better friends in the future to other people and i hope that none of them ever experience the pain of having your friends um, betray you en masse without even an ounce of fucking skepticism. Uh, I hope they never experience what I experienced at their hands. Uh, I think that the friends that I have made over the past year and a half um, and the friends that have stayed with me, the few, the people who I, I call them the few um, as opposed to the many because the many bailed. Um, the few stayed, and the few are spectacular. Um, different kind of human being. Uh, the, 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 the real humanists, the real caring people, the people who care when it's hard to care, the people who, who uh, look for answers when a convenient truth is being thrust in front of them, they still look for the actual answer. Um, I would say, that, uh, you know, I was leading an unethical life, okay? I was cheating on my wife, uh, and it was not ethical. Um, I would uh, say that that was a symptom of a sad, of an unhappy marriage. Um, and I would say that, uh, um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm a different, I'm a different guy than I was two years ago. I, um, I'm, I am a stronger yet extremely injured person. And if I were to go back and talk to him, um, I would say that um, that betrayal is everywhere. I, I would say that betrayal is everywhere. And I would say that uh, there's no uh, there's no need for knowledge behind the betrayal. There's no need for anything other than popularity. I was betrayed en masse because it was cool to do. I was betrayed, I, I, you said it yourself, Paul, I, I, I've been in this movement for decades um, and I built a thing. I built a life, a good, solid life. I was gonna go to Congress. 
or at least I was going to try. Uh, I was going to be, in my brain, I was going to be the first openly atheist congressman person. And all I needed to do was just keep building American atheists and 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 and, and normalizing atheism, and, I, and that would be my victory lap, getting a seat in Congress. That's all over now. That can never happen now. And the reason is because I uh, trusted too many people, and I was so quick not quick, but I was really inside that wokest mentality. I was really inside that in-group, like when I talked to you and you and I had our, our disagreement. Um, I mean, I was I was not a humanist, or at least I thought I was, but I wasn't. I wasn't, yeah, I was a humanist, but I wasn't a skeptic. Right. Uh, um, and, you know, I thought less of people who didn't agree with me simply on the fact that they didn't agree with the extent of my uh, of, of my thoughts. So, I mean, I was in this um, judgmental, yet emotionally impotent place. Um, I was, it, it was, you know, do you ever see Back to the Future? Oh, yeah. Okay, so there's a scene when... Um, Marty McFly originally goes back to the past, goes to the past, and he's at that um, that soda place, that, that little diner. Sure. And uh, Biff, the bad guy, comes in with his cronies. Yeah, with Billy right. Zane. <laughs> right, right. And, and they start, um, they start um, giving Marty shit because he's wearing a vest. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, That's in the Navy. He called it, so you're the Navy boy? Right, right, right. And there's these other people around them, and they're going, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was one of them. I was one of them. And um, that's an embarrassing and shameful place to be. Well, it, it's important. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. That's, that's, it. that's it. I think it's important to understand how we get to those places, because I don't think that you got to that place because you were the kind of person who goes, ha, ha, ha. I think there's this, this kind of, uh, I've never known you to be that way. Um, I don't really can't think of you as the type of person who bows to peer pressure. But I did. Well, you, you, you may have, but I also think there's a deeper issue that I see, which is how we get to thought processes with how we function in groups and how, how we view the world. I've seen this happen too where, uh, God, I'm trying to remember this guy's name. His name is Steve Shimes. He's a, a YouTube <laughs> atheist, right? No, oh, um, yeah. Okay, and his <laughs> whole thing is, you know, he's all about, uh, bot blocking, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, blocking people, and then I think about some people that called me after Trump was, and they were, you know, I never predicted that Trump was going to win, but I remember stating openly, I said, if this guy loses the election, he's going to lose by a fairly small margin. That was actually my position. People were like, how did you know? They remembered it as I, I predicted he he was going to win. And they said, how did you know he's going to win? I said, well, the first thing I corrected them on is I didn't say he was going to win. I, I said I. It said there was something seriously wrong with people think he was going to lose in a landslide. And it's kind of like that Steve Shives mentality, which is if I build this insular world where I shut everybody out who doesn't fit into it, I feel very empowered. I feel in control of my environment. I feel like we're changing the world around us because there's nobody in the world that doesn't agree with us. And the few that fall out of favor, we can crush them, stomp on them, and we'll just march on to this vision that we know in our heads is right. Mm -hmm. And they'll just fall into place or they'll just get crushed. And I think that there's probably... You know, I don't think that people think about it in those terms. I don't think that they analyze it that way, but I think that that subconsciously that is what's going on, which is is that they, they get into this very comfortable place where they can see the future. They can see the way they think things need to be. And people that don't fit into that world do not fit into that world. They're not allowed into that world. And people that are in that world that fall out of favor, well, they're betraying the group. You know, they're, betray they're, they're undermining the mission. And I'm just wondering how much of that, you know, plays a role in kind of what happened here, which is, you know, I think that's what happened to you, but I also think it's important for everyone out there to think about, are they doing that to other people, and how long does that 
because man, we are. I don't know anybody who agrees a hundred percent on everything with politics. No. So sooner or later, they are going to wind up in an outgroup. Sooner or later, they are going to have this done to them, and people really have to start retooling how they deal with people that don't just that don't agree with them. I kind of was talking earlier about you know someone was super right wing and yet they still believe in the right for a woman to, say, have an abortion. My leftist background um, really stressed a terminology called solidarity. Mm -hmm. You find solidarity with people where you can find it. Yes. So it's kind of like you and I may not agree on whatever position is that we don't agree on, but we both benefit by solidarity on the issues we do. And the opposition out there that wants to keep us divided knows how to play us if we will never speak to each other because of a secondary issue. So if I can't talk to you, Dave Silverman, about gay rights, you know, be, you know, because you are anti-choice, you know, then gay rights never advances. Right. Be, you know, and that's the problem. You know, I was at a, um, I was in London a couple of weeks ago at a, a convention called Speaking to Social Justice. And it was about the wokest movement and how it's infiltrating. And it was run by a man named Michael. I forget his last name. Michael is an, uh, a high-end evangelical preacher. He is a um, he's the manager for somebody that I've debated in the past. And he hugged me. He hugged me because. He was really happy to see me. Truly, he was happy to see me because his church is being infiltrated by wokeism. His religion is being infiltrated by wokeism. Scripture is being subjected to power dynamics. God is being judged for creating the patriarchy. And he is watching his religion be eaten by the ins from the inside. And he and I bonded. He and I bonded. And we said over our common enemy, and you know we we, we kind of left it out with you know we're going to fight this thing together, and if we succeed, we'll know we succeeded when we can do something as fun and light as debate whether or not God exists again, because we can't do that anymore. We have more important things to do, and that's exactly what's going on. I mean. Think about that, an evangelical leader and an atheist leader, not, not, there's no, there's no pomp here. There was no positioning. There's no, like, we're not doing anything for publicity or anything like that. We bonded over a common enemy because we're both, because both of our lifestyles are in danger. And now the big thing that we used to fight about and we used to get all upset about each other is not relevant. It's not important right now. We can do that. When things get better, we can go back to that lower level priority thing. Right now, we have to deal with the high priority of the fact that we can't even have a conversation. We can't even have a conversation without being accused and, 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 and dismissed and destroyed by this terroristic organization. This terroristic, I don't want to call it an organization, but it's certainly a terroristic mentality. You know, uh, 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 I mentioned... I mean, look at the terroristic mentality here. I lost everything. I have a whole bunch of proof that shows that I lost everything and I didn't actually do the crime. And still, when AAI hired me, Secular Woman, the feminist organization in atheism, the president announced that she was going to go after the special, the, the UN status that AAI has. So we're gonna use that UN status to help save lives and rescue ex-Muslims from, from Arabic nations. She doesn't care. She does, they don't care, nobody cares because I'm that evil. I am so evil to these people that any organization that hires me deserves to go down even if human lives are lost, right. literally. This is what we're dealing with here. Well, this the other, is terrorism. The other side of this coin is what <laughs> their, their organization 
gain or lose by you doing what you're doing with the organization. They, and this is, it's like, it's like, well, if we don't stop him, he's going to do what? And well, or arrest me. Right. If I'm a danger, arrest me. Right. But the other side of this is, well, he is, he is misrepresenting our community. It's like, well, let me tell you, they're not doing a very good job of representing the community. And this is a question is, uh, you know, it's like we can first of all accept the fact that we all are going to have to learn to live together on this rock with our differences, or we can all die on this rock with our differences. And and the thing that I would say to people like this is that even if even if you did do this or whatever it is, okay, it has no bearing on your underlying mesh, you know, message. It has no bearing. It's like you can still be an atheist and have made mistakes in your life. You can still, you know. Uh, have a dysfunctional part of your life and still see you still have a voice in this world it's like why do we need to strip somebody's voice because they either did or alleged to have done something we don't like uh, are they no longer a human being do they no longer have a right to say something um, it's it's it, and that should tell us a great deal about those who are perpetuating this travesty yeah Be because it's like if I don't know how their organization has anything to do with the UN in this particular situation. Nothing. Right. And so what, what is it that they think that they're championing? Like, let's say that they're successful. What would they lay on the table to show positive by their actions? Let's say that they're successful and got the UN, uh, you know, status stripped from this organization. What is the benefit of that? They get to show that they're powerful. There you go. They get this to show that they're powerful. They get this to show not about justice. They will raise money. And, and those men, women, and children who may die, literally, because we're losing the power of the UN status, those human beings who may die are not relevant. I guess maybe because they're ex-Muslims, maybe because they're brown, maybe because they're not the big evil Dave that, 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 that they think I am. And, and Paul, they think I'm really evil. They think I'm really evil. They think I'm, I mean, you should see what they say about me. They, they won't have anything to do with anyone who has anything to do with me. I'm really an evil, evil person. And now what does that mean? Well, there may be actual bad people in this movement. And those people are going to get sheltered because I'm being called the worst there is, and I didn't do anything. So what about the people who are actually doing bad? What about the bad, it, I, I'm assuming that there are bad guys in our movement, that there are bad men in our movement, there are certainly bad women, Rose and Beth, but there are certainly bad guys in our movement too that are doing bad things. What about them? Now here's the other question. Is there any of that? And if there isn't, is all of this just a reflection of the fact that there really isn't any problem in the atheism, that I'm the worst there is, and I'm not all that bad because I actually didn't do it, but because of the accusations, I'm the worst there is. I wonder if this is all just victim mentality, yeah. that, 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 there's no, that feminism won, so we're going to keep screaming about something, and Dave didn't do anything, but nobody's doing anything. Uh, women are actually safe in the atheist movement. Well, uh, I can't say that. I'll tell you uh, a little something. I haven't talked about it much in general, and I'm not going to say a whole lot of it now. But I actually was violently sexually assaulted when I was a minor. And I, I can tell you don't have to apologize because you're not the one who did it. And that's part of the problem I'm having here. And it's very frustrating when I hear people talk about I, all these people who champion this shit are themselves have never come out and said they've been victimized. You, you know, the, the people who lead these crusades are claiming they're doing it for other people. They would, they own my, what happened to me, they can speak for me. And no, I speak for myself, you know, and this is part of the thing that's really frustrating for somebody who's been through something like this, which is you're not even allowed to identify what happened to you. People will tell you how you were a victim. They will tell you how destroyed and hurt and damaged you are. And they will tell you what you need to do to rectify it. Nobody fucking wants to hear from me. Nobody wants to hear. I can't tell you how many times I've had people online go, have you ever been a victim of a sexual assault? I'm like, yeah, actually I have, so fuck off. You know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like, um, 
you know, I, it's really frustrating to hear somebody who acts like they have something that, that they have my interest in mind, and I don't see my interest ever at the forefront of what they're pushing. Um, it, it usually is very, very uh, altruistic. It, it has to do with them. It has to do with their status. It has to do with the way they move up their social ladder. I don't really see people, um, you know, I, I don't really see people who have been sexual assault survivors behaving the way that a lot of these SJWs do. Somebody who's been through this, and, and of course there's no such thing as everybody having the identical experience. Some people deal with it very differently than others. But I have never, I've had to go to therapy and I've been through, you know, group sessions and all this stuff. And I don't see anybody out there just leading a crusade. People, you know, a lot of times what you want to do is forget. First of all, depending on how bad it was, you may not really remember what happened to you with great clarity. Um, but you spend a lot of your time not wanting to deal with it. You, know, you want to put it behind you. The ways that you learn to cope with it, um, you don't, if you really want to get a grip on this kind of thing, you don't see yourself as a victim. You see yourself as a survivor. And if you really want to be honest, I hate to say it, it sounds kind of cruel. It's just some shit that happened to you. Because you know we have kids that have had arms and legs blown off in the third world, and they and they get through life. You know, there's yeah. horrible fucking shit that happens to people every goddamn day around this world. People's families die of of diarrhea, of of horrible conditions. And if we go and live our lives by you know, I cannot live my life as a victim because it will because that would destroy me. That would destroy me if I lived my life down in the gutter, pitying myself and, you know, saw myself as a broken person, then that's where I will be. You got to pick yourself up. You got to move on. You got to be a better person, you know, despite what's happened to you. There's all sorts of dysfunctional things you look at, too, like um, the way you view the world will always be through that lens. You'll never have the exact same lens as somebody who didn't go through it. And that's part of how I know that a lot of the people that are pushing this stuff are full of crap. So when you, say that, when you say that you have been through something, do you get sympathy? Do you get, do you get compassion or do you get a blow off because you're a white guy? Most people will say, I'm sorry it happened to you, just like you did. Um, and I, I, I appreciate the sentiment that somebody doesn't want something to have happened to someone else. But the truth is you didn't do anything to me. The person who did it did it. Right. And, and that's the person who owes me an apology. That's the person who needs to answer for what they did. Um, I don't fucking want to exact revenge on society. I don't need to target white men. I don't need to target white women. I don't need to target, you know, all people are not scum. Um, you know, there's not, gr God damn, this, this stuff about like the mentality of like, we need to teach men not to rape. You do not mean to tell me that it's in, like people don't know inherently there's something sick and wrong and yicky that 99% of the people out there, if you talk about rape, they, they kind of recoil. They, they don't react well to it. Mm -hmm. That you need to teach someone. Someone who's raping isn't doing it because somebody didn't go, well, gee, you shouldn't rape. That's not right. <laughs> there's something seriously fucked up wrong in their head. Yes. Something that is dysfunctional about that person, they need you. They need to probably, depending on you know what they did and what they're doing, need to be removed from society, or you know at least until until they're caught, you know, corrected. I mean, it's it's really dangerous what this SJW movement is doing, and I think that they're also doing real harm to real rape survivors. I think that they're they're doing real harm. Uh, to people who are victims, because those people that are victims don't even feel they have a voice. They don't feel, they feel that these groups have usurped their voice for their own purposes. Which is true, which is true. The reason, the, the reason that I asked you that is the same reason that, I mean, I have a lot, you know, one of the things that, that I've learned and one of the interesting experience that has come forward out of this is that a lot of people, a lot of women, uh, have come to me and said, I was a sexual abuse, I'm a sexual abuse survivor, and I believe you. And they're angry at the SJWs for what they did and how they're doing it. And, and what I've come to understand is that um, the reason that I haven't been, that, that, that there's been like no fucking police reports or anything like that, 
is because I'm an innocent person and everybody knows it. The reason they hate me anyways is because this is not about protecting women. It's not about protecting anybody. It's about power. Yeah. It's about exercising power. They're using intersectionality. They're using anything that they can to get power for themselves. Manette Richards wants power. She wants to take away AAI's uh, seat. It doesn't matter who dies. It matters that Manette can say, yes, I fucked over Dave Silverman and we got him again. That's what this is about. It's about power. It's about greed. It's about um, this, this horrible, unhumanistic um, attitude where they can literally use victims like you. And I don't even like to use the word victim, and, and I'm not trying to use it in a pejorative sense, but they're using victims um, so that they can get power so that they can be well regarded in their echo chambers. That's all this is. That's yep. why it's vapid. That's why there's no knowledge base behind it because nobody's doing any research because if you do research, you might realize, hey, you know what? What they're doing is actually gonna hurt people so you probably shouldn't fucking do that. They don't well, care about that. There, and there is something to be said, David, too, about, you know, again, I, I look at the early 90s, uh, I look into the early 2000s, I look into you know, the 2010s, and look at the progression of the atheist movement. Yeah. And the more I'm of the opinion, the more we started getting into things like feminism, yeah. the more we got into things like transgender rights, things of that nature, the less it became about atheism. Oh, yeah. And, and it's not that here's the way I approached it on the show that I had. Okay. I had people that wanted, wanted to come on and they wanted to talk about. Uh, you know, black atheism and how black people are repressed in the atheist community and all this other stuff. And I said, here's the thing. You have to tie two things together, okay? I don't have a problem with you talking about being black, but this is an atheist skeptic show. So, so we need to be able to talk about how that ties to religion. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like if you are uh, an atheist and a skeptic and you're black and you've been kicked out of your church or something like that, that makes sense. If you want to talk about how black people are being purged, you know, from colleges because they don't buy into mathematics or something like that, that has nothing to do with the core value of what we're trying to promote. That's just playing into the victim card that black people are oppressed all the time, everywhere, over everything. Right. And maybe there's a place for that, but it's not on a show about atheism and skepticism. You know, you have your own show, you do your own thing, if you feel that that's what you want. And I feel the atheist community let its guard down, um, and because they are humanists, they care about people, they care about human, human beings, and I think there was a lot of naivety where, you know, we let stuff in the door, and once it was in the door, it, it was terrifying to get rid of it because it was vicious, and it, and it, and it attacked when it didn't get what it wanted. Yeah. And, and um, it's kind of like, well, if I let this person in, I gave them a voice, and now they're denouncing me. And, and that's what they did. I mean, I was going to make a real good point, and I just lost it. Yeah. Well, I, while, while you're thinking about your point, I want to say don't give up on your ideas of running for politics. You, you know, Dave, you don't know what the future holds. Um, people are going to be assholes no matter what. You would have just caught in flack from a different group of assholes before. Well, and you're, you're right. And I know that, and, and I, I remembered the point that I wanted to make, and I, and I want to make it. Uh, there was this perception, so there was this cause and effect perception that there weren't any, there weren't enough women in the atheism movement, therefore the atheism movement was preventing women from coming in. Uh, there weren't enough black leaders, therefore there was racism. And, and, and so, we became this, this animal where uh, we had to combat the racism and the misogyny that was in the movement that was holding down these minorities um, based solely on the fact that there weren't enough minorities, there weren't enough women in there, but we took on the blame. There weren't enough women because it was our fault. Right. There weren't enough black people because it was our fault. Yeah. And, and we were there talking about atheism and um, 
you know, we, we, we had our share of, of, of diversity, but it wasn't enough. And the fact that it wasn't enough wasn't the fact that there were no black leaders in the atheist movement at the time. The fact, the, 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 the reason was that we were somehow not bringing them in, not doing our part to bring them in. And so it became our fault and it always became our fault. So it became a race to, to, um, to create equity in our lineup. To, to have an equity lineup, uh, even when there wasn't representation. In other words, uh, we had one female black leader in the movement, so she was everywhere. And that's great, she was great, but at the same time, it wasn't our fault that there was only one, right? Or, or, or just- well, it's, not, it's not your fault. And the other side, the question is, well, how do you fill those gaps? Do you fill it with someone who has the educational credentials, the, the social standing that, that's built the reputation in the community? Or do you fill it with someone because they're black or because they're a woman? That's right. the thing. And right. so now I'm, now I'm having a less good convention. Right. Because instead of having this A-plus speaker who can come in and talk, instead of having Richard Dawkins, right. I have some black woman, some dude, some, some black dude, some, some, some interracial, yeah. Intersectional person come in and talk about the same topic, but they don't have the same kind of pull. They don't have the same kind of drive. They don't have the same knowledge. Uh, so I'm having a less good convention in exchange for having a, a lineup with more equity in it. Well, we saw, and I, and again, I'm not going to discuss too many of the back dealings of Reason Rally, but you you know there was someone in there that bit the hand of everyone at Reason Rally. Yeah. That, that in my position thought was shouldn't have been in that position and i got the feeling and i don't know i wasn't privy to some of the, the discussions at the level i was at in that organization um but i got the i got the impression that she was largely in that position because she was a woman and and um i do a lot of work with uh, concerts uh, huge political conventions. It's one of the staples of where I earn my income. Um, and I remember watching the process and I said, this just, you know, it wasn't my place to say anything. And I wasn't even sure if I would be received if I had protested certain things I was seeing. Um, but I said, this person is not asking the right questions. This person, they, it, it's like, I was kind of a little amazed that a outside PR agency hadn't been hired that deals with these types of things and it was being held by someone who was an atheist who also seemed to fill a, a social justice role who didn't have a background in this. And so it's kind of like, um, you know, the way she bit everybody was bad enough, but there were certain things that fell through the cracks that I that I think that if you know, I, I hate to say it, it should have been treated as a commercial venture. <laughs> you know, I mean, we, you know, because you were selling T-shirts, you were trying to get people to pay for live stream. There are people out there who are experts on that stuff that know how to, to how to maximize profit off of it. Yeah. And it's not that, I, that not that I wanted the, the the thing to be profit driven, but I wanted to be a successful leading to Reason Rally Three. Yeah. And the way you do that is you make sure that your fin that that the organization is financially solvent and and able to move through that process. And um, and of course, when she got done with it we were all left trying to pick up the pieces. So, you know, um, and Dave, all of that stuff can actually make you a better leader. I mean, having been through all of this, learning the life lessons that you've learned, having the experience that you have, uh, there's no reason you should ever have to like say, well, this, this opportunity is no longer open to me because you're in a much, you, you, no, I mean, people, have, there's no reason. I mean, you make the decision because it's right for you. But you have all of this added knowledge now. We learn through our mistakes, and you'll be more resolute, more resolved, um, wiser. You can see things coming that much more clearly down the road. Don't ever sell yourself short on what you aim for. Uh, right. One of the reasons I got in this movement is because of the things you were doing. So it's like I remember the Dave Silverman that was on Fox News. You know, I remember, you know, the signs up on the highways and, you know, so don't ever sell yourself short. I appreciate that, Paul. I really do. 
Uh, it, it's been an hour twenty. It's, I yep. didn't expect this conversation to go this long, <laughs> but I'm having. But I had a, a, a really uh, good time. I think we should probably wrap it up. Sounds uh, good. It's been a it's been a good conversation, Paul. I appreciate. Uh, it. I, I appreciate your time, and I appreciate your friendship, and I appreciate you reaching out to me, and and, and reconnecting with me. Uh, so many people have, and I appreciate the fuck out of it. I appreciate <laughs> the fuck out of it. I really do. Well, I hope you and I can find ways to collaborate in the future. And um, you know, you, you know, you you say you learn who your real friends are, and going back to that conversation that we had in that email exchange about not being sure we could be friends. I, I I've always been my hands extended to you. I hope we always can get back. <laughs> uh, if there's anything I can ever do to support you in your efforts to promote atheism and skepticism, you just feel free to give me a ring, and I will employ whatever assets and knowledge and whatnot I have to, to try to make that work, okay? Uh, thank you, Paul. I really appreciate that. I may take you up on it. Um, and uh, thank you so much for, for being on here, and, and we'll talk to you sometime real soon. All right. I hope people find this useful, and I, I hope people uh, can see the human being that I know as Dave Silverman. Okay. Take care.